So welcome, Danny. Well, thank you. This is going to be a fun talk for me. It's not the usual talk that I give, so I say. Um, but, but it was sort of fun for me to think about. I do get such joy in making things, in particular the project that I'm making now is this 10,000 year clock, which I'll, I'll get to. Um, but um, when, when Mrs. Ross asked me to talk about my childhood and how I became a maker and so on, I really started thinking about it. And my, I lived an unusual childhood because my uh, father was a doctor. And so wherever there was hepatitis epidemic, we would move there. And so we moved around lots of parts of the world. Um, and I was mostly exposed to doctors and biologists. Um, and my one interest outside was collecting rocks. And so I would end up in schools and always be the new kid there and sometimes be a bit lost. But when I was in fourth grade, there was a librarian named Mrs. Wilner. And I would always go in and asked for books on rocks. And she got to know me a little bit, and she suggested some other books for me to read. She started suggesting to me books on electricity, um, which I hadn't really thought about, kind of engineering books. And she suggested to me, I, I found this morning on the internet a picture of it, a fiction book, this book, Wonderful Trip to the Mushroom Planet. And which was about a couple of kids who actually built their own spaceship. And they had some adult help and so on, but for various reasons, the spaceship had to be built by kids. And it went into a lot of details as to how they built the spaceship and so on. And it kind of got me excited about building things. And I actually went back and I tried building rockets and almost blew myself up a few times. And, but I also started trying building the electronic stuff that I was reading about in these books that Mrs. Wilner had given me. And, I, and of course, we were moving around, so I couldn't really get electronic components. So in India, there was a science fair, and I decided I was going to make a computer. And I knew from this electrical book about switches and wiring and so on, but I couldn't buy switches. So I made switches out of nails in a piece of board that would stick into a piece of screen. And I used lights from a flashlight, and I entered the science fair, uh, and I won that soldering iron. <laughs> um, and that's my computer down there. And here you can kind of see the switches that I built with wires going to them. They're really boards with nails in them. And, you know, and it played tic-tac-toe by moving the switches around. And that got me very interested in computers. And of course, eventually I did go to MIT. And while I was at MIT, I continued having fun of how you could make computers kind of of anything. So just for fun at MIT, I built this machine, which is in the, the Boston Science Museum now, which was a computer entirely out of, of Tinker Toys. That's right. And, um, and then you know, I went on later to build big computers. That was the fastest computer in the world at the time that it was built. It was the first big parallel computer. This was another, uh, this, then became the fastest computer. It was kind of the first thing that's what today we'd call the cloud of parallel machines and so on. So that became my profession, but it really was a direct line of, of chain from that original book that, that Mrs. Wilner had given me. The other thing I was always interested in, and yet she had gotten me interested and she gave me books about robots. I started building robots. This would have been my entire talk had I not changed it, but this was you know, an early robot that I built when I was working for Seymour Papert that was a robot turtle that had a pen in it and it could draw pictures. This was before computers could draw pictures on the screen. So this was a way that kids could actually write computer programs. And I got really interested in the computer as a way of letting kids make things because when you make things as a, as a kid, of course, you're always running out of parts and you know, you can't, you burn yourself on the soldering iron and it's really hard to solder and you don't really have the tools to cut the metal. And, and one of the nice things about building things in the computer is you have an infinite number of parts and you can make very complicated things inside the computer. And so for me, the computer was a way of building things too and it was a way of sharing my love of building things with kids. And I still think that is a really one of the most important ways to use computers is kind of give 
know, kids a chance to really construct things and build things. It's a world in which you're only limited by your imagination. Um, I, I later went on to build bigger robots. This is a robot. This is the inside of a robot dinosaur that I built for Disney. It's a full size triceratops. Would actually walk around. Um, I made the mistake of frightening Michael Eisner with it, and so it never got into the park. But <laughs> he, he made me make it smaller and fuzzier. But it was <laughs> I, I thought I'd just give him a surprise, but it was. <laughs> Um, so I built a lot of robots, but so I, I built a lot of things that are useful machines. But I've also just loved the act of building itself. And at one point um, in the 1990s, I heard a story, which was about New College Oxford, and New College Oxford was built sometime in the 15th century, or was founded sometime in the 15th century, and they built a common room. And the common room had these big oak beams in it. And in the 20th century, the oak beams had finally um, rotted enough that they needed replacing. But by then, you couldn't just go down to the store, lumber store and buy a 40-foot oak beam. Um, but the people that were renovating the college apparently knew that Oxford had some forests, and so they went and asked the forester if there were any oak trees that could be harvested that were big enough. And the forester said, yes, we have the oak trees that were planted to replace the beams in New College. And when I heard that story, I thought, wow, that's so different than how we think today. And this was, remember, during the 1990s, everybody was you know, worrying about the Y2K problem. And, and I realized, you know what, when, when I was a little kid, people used to worry about what it would be like in the year 2000. Now it's 1995 and people are worrying about the year 2000. They're not thinking past that. And in fact, it's, it was as if the future had been shrinking one year per year for my whole life. And I really care about the future. I've always loved the future. I've always sort of imagined living in it. It's in some sense more real to me than the present. And somehow it felt to me like the future was being taken away from me. And when I heard that story about New College, I I realized that you know, people used to have a longer future. And somehow, the pace of technology has taken that away. So I wanted to do something. I wanted to live in that longer future, in that bigger future. So being a builder, I decided I wanted to build something that would stretch to the future. And so I started thinking about building this large mechanical clock. So a clock that would last for 10,000 years. And of course, it would have to be mechanical, because electronics can't last that long. Or, um, but you could build physical, mechanical things that could do it. And so I started, I built a prototype. I had never built a clock before. This one is in the London Science Museum, if you ever go visit it. Um, it was my first prototype of the clock. Um, but it was a mechanical clock that sort of did the computations of the, of the motions. It displays uh, the position of the sky after 10,000 years. Um, this was another one that I built, which was an orrery that as a planet, this one's actually in the Long Now Foundation's office in San Francisco, which if you ever visit there, I encourage you to build it. You know, and it has stones for planets, which kind of goes back to my original love of collecting rocks and stones and so on. But, as, but what I really want to do, all of this was kind of practice, because in my mind, I had the idea of a clock that was in a mountain. Because for 10,000 years, no building is going to last 10,000 years. Probably no city is going to last 10,000 years. So I had to house the clock in a mountain. So I had a picture in my mind, and I would, um, and the picture in my mind, you would come up to this cliff, and you would kind of go into a hole in a mountain after hiking through a desert, and you would explore and find a cave, and you would eventually end up climbing up through past machinery. Um, into a big chamber, and when you got to the chamber, you would see a clock, and you would see the date on the clock, reading not the date that it was there now, but the date that the last person had been there. And then when you wound the clock, it would move forward to the current date, the current time, the current configuration of the sky, of the sun, and the moon, and the stars, and it would stop there. And then, when the sun went overhead at noon, 
the light would shine down to the clock, and it would chime, and it would ring a set of chimes. And so that was this image that I had. And so for years, uh, I went around looking for the right mountain, had a few false starts, um, eventually found it. But I, I had some uh, very good friends um, like Mrs. Ross that <laughs> would <laughs> encourage me and keep, keep, keep me going. And eventually, I settled on this mountain here, which is right on the Texas and Mexico border. And this is actually after we started. There's the cliff that you can just see the excavations down here where we're opening up that door. So that hole into the cliff, a lot like that sketch. So you hike up to this mountain, you go into the cliff, you go into a door that looks very much like that sketch. And you see up here we have, we're beginning to build equipment there because we have to, even, even to build the thing, well first of all we had to build a road even to get the equipment in, and then we have to bring in the equipment. <laughs> um, so that that in itself is a big thing. But you know, this is the this is the beginnings of the hole in the in the mountain. And so as we cut into the mountain, uh, one of the things that I wanted to do was to uh, I looked every place, and part of my fantasy was that at some point you go into this hole in the mountain and find yourself in a natural cave. Um, but of course, you can't find where a cave is in the mountain. So my thought was, well, I'll just build, I'll build a big cave. So I, I drew the maps that going, going in 40 feet, and we'll put the cave there. And then you know, the clock will go off from that. So, so we went in, we blasted in 40 feet. I went away because it takes a long time with dynamite and so on to cut through. And then we got in 40 feet, and we found this giant, beautiful cave with stalactites and stalagmites. And this is like, it was just there exactly where, uh, where, we, where I wanted a cave, where I had drawn it to build it. So there's a, a giant natural cave. And then we went off and, and cut into the mountain more. And then the, eventually you get to a point in the mountain where you go up this, those steps and we built a machine um, which I could give a whole talk about, where we cut up through the mountain 500 feet. Actually, we cut down and then reamed up, and then built a robot which climbs up the, that shaft like an inchworm with a diamond, saw, a diamond saw. And slowly, you can see it cutting. This is the stairway that it's cutting, building the spiral staircase up, the, up inside. And in the meantime, what we've been doing is we've been actually building the, the gears and the machinery. This is, this is one of the gears from the clock, one of the bigger gears. And these are you know, built in shipyards, the only place that can build big enough things. Of course, there's tiny parts. These are special. Here's, um, a lot of it is about materials. Everything is made of materials that can last for 10,000 years. So it's made of ceramics. Uh, it's made of titanium. Uh, quartz. So these are some ceramic bearings. Um, there's, uh, for instance, this is the lens that focuses the sunlight. The way that it keeps synchronized is that sun shining down in the summer solstice. Um, there's a giant piece of quartz that's ground into a lens. This is actually the piece of quartz. And it focuses the light on the mechanical things and warms them up. And it knows that the sun is directly overhead, so it adjusts the the clock forward or backwards. And so the clock will actually keep accurate time for, for 10,000 years. I'll just show you some of the mechanisms. And the clock is still under construction. Um, let me see if I can get this movie to run. And so. These are the, this is the rack that pulls the weight up. So this is just some, some, some pieces of the clock to give you an idea of the scale of it. And these are some of, the, some of the engineers that have been working on it. So this is the winder that you actually lift the, lift the weight with. This is all this machinery will be in the shaft in the mountain eventually. So 
this will be stacked on top of that. Um, there's a giant um, 15 ton weight which powers the clock because it lifts up and down in the shaft. So these are actually just a few of the parts. This is a, a small section of the clock, but you get some idea of the scale of it. So it's, the project has been such a joy for me because it's been a chance to learn about everything from ancient calendar systems, to visit the Issei Shrine in, in Kyoto, um, to learn about the materials and um, the physics of making clocks. And uh, so it's also been a way of you know, getting involved with some of the most interesting people that I've met in my life. I mean, I got interested in the chimes and, and went to a friend of mine, Brian Eno, and he had the suggestion of making the chimes chime a different bell every time, every day for 10,000 years. It turns out it only takes 10 bells to do that. So then I built a, a mechanism that actually changes the order of the bells every day. Um, I've, we got involved, for instance, in writing the manual of the clock to say, well, let's build a Rosetta Stone so that people will be able to read the manual. And got involved in collecting up languages of the world and now have collected the biggest, the Long Now Foundation has collected the biggest collection of parallel languages of, uh, of basically 1,500 languages, the same text in each one, which we've preserved and actually sent a copy of it out into space on the Rosetta mission, and so there's all these wonderful spin-out projects. So it's just, it's just been fantastic. But it's a project that everyone is just working on because of the, of the joy of doing it. But if I go back and sort of look at, at sort of what the crucial turning point was that kind of got me down that track and that joy of building things, I really do think that, that Mrs. Wilner, you know, when she brought me those books, when she took the trouble to realize that, yeah, I was, said I was interested in rocks. And I am still interested in rocks. But she took the trouble to get me, to know me enough to realize you know, where that interest was coming from, what you know, potentially else I was interested in, and encouraged me and inspired me and kind of got me going, opened up new doors for me. And, uh, you know, that was, that was a huge thing for me. And actually, this is a sort of wonderful codicil to the story, which is um, a few years ago, Newsweek was doing something on teaching and impact of teachers. And they called up, and, and I was saying, you know, one of the things teachers can do is they can, you know, not, they don't just have a set of knowledge to impart to children, but they understand the potential of children, and they can kind of open up new doors to them uh, that maybe they didn't even weren't even aware they existed. And I told them this story, and and they and I said, if you if you use this story, would you please use Mrs. Wilner's name? And so they did. They did publish the story, and they did use her name. And I thought, you know, she's probably. I remembered her as being very very old, um, <laughs> but. <laughs> <laughs> it occurred to me, well, maybe my memory of what very, very old meant didn't really mean that much. And so <laughs> I, I uh, traced her down. And you know, with the internet, I managed to you know, find a story in some church bulletin that she had moved to some town. And you know, eventually called, uh, called up the only Wilner in that town. Of course, I didn't know her first name. Um, and I called her up. And I said, hi, this is, this is Danny Hellas, and I just, I just wanted to thank you. And I told her what I thanked her for. And she said, you know, I, I do remember you. And she said, also, since that um, article came out, so many people have written me letters, and so many other children have written me letters. And I realized, I never understood it before, how much impact I had had. And this is just such a wonderful gift to realize, you know, having the pe people contact me, that it, you know, I wasn't the only one that she did that for. That was her way of, of interacting with, with her students. And so, you know, 
know, I, I see the kinds of projects that people do in the Ross School, and, I, and I've had enough interaction with your students that I know you do to this kind of opening up their passions and their interests. And I just want to say I think it's a wonderful thing, and, and it has a big impact. So thank you for that. Thank you, Danny. Um, so isn't that the perfect presentation for Ross School? It just had to be. Maybe you'll come back and do the other one some other time. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I know you spent the morning uh, sort of imagineering. He, Dan, he and Danny was an imagineer also at, at Disney. It was a very smart thing that they brought in all these incredible people to enliven different Disney departments. But uh, what I'd like to know in terms of what you, you um, spoke about this morning and also the questions that you have with Dan, for Danny in terms of uh, this interest in, at Ross from the Innovation Lab to individual classrooms of st students making or any other questions you have, whether it's technology or rocks or, or, or whatever, who might have a question? Oh. <laughs> My question is, where is the, how far have you gotten with your clock, and do you see a date that it'll be done? Well, I've only been working on it for a couple of decades, and I'm more than halfway done. Okay, great. So, I and it's very you. hard to hike up to, so I think that's, you know, it sort of sets a, a limit for me, because huh. of course I have to hike up to it. So. Right. <laughs> Thanks. Who else? Yes, Matt. So uh, my name is Matthew. I've been here for um, a long time. Uh, I came when we started the high school. And um, I think, as far as I know, I am actually the only uh, member of the Ross faculty or staff that's actually a card-carrying member of the Long Now. Oh, right. <laughs> and um, I read the book many years ago. I've been following the construction of the clock. Um, with through videos, so I was seeing most of the things that you put up there. So I, I want to thank you personally oh. for inspiring me to think differently about the future. I'm really a, a historian, I'm a history teacher here, so I think mostly about the past, but I've thought more about the future because I'm here and because I've been exposed to people that Courtney has brought to us, and it's a great honor to have you finally here with us, um, so thank you. Well, 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 thank you as a member for letting me do it. I mean, you all, I, I didn't mention this, but the, the Long Now Foundation was basically, I started this project and never would have gotten it done except Stuart Brand came up to me and said, you know, you need a foundation to help you do this. And so we started the Long Now Foundation, which you know, now has all kinds of other projects and is actually the, is mostly paid for by people like you, most of the funding for the foundation actually comes from, from individual members who, you know, I'm, we, we can't quite figure out what, what we're giving you, but, but we really appreciate. <laughs> well, for, for those of you, you, go to the site, go to their website, they have uh, wonderful videos, they have all kinds of speakers that, talk, that uh, they, they um, um, Stuart uh, moderates with all the time, it's great. Yeah. They've now opened a bar in San Francisco, which is um, a place yeah. where you can go and get drinks there. So, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's worth visiting. Uh, what I would like to talk about a little bit is um, a, a sort of a personal aspect of this whole thing, because I want to talk a little bit about future thinking, particularly when it comes to um, medical technology and genetic engineering, uh, which I know is not your particular field, but I think you probably have some interesting uh, aspect of it. And um, I want to start by telling a story because I'm a storyteller, so I want to tell a story first. Uh, and that was at about 25 years ago, I stood up in a group um, much like this. Uh, it was mostly prospective teachers um, at NYU. Uh, and in New York State, everyone is required to take a class on um, drug and alcohol and child abuse. So you can't teach in this state without doing so. And I sat there in the class with about 60 people like you. and. One of the things that the teacher was talking about was a way to identify um, child abuse, and, and one of the things she talked about was the 
five finger bruise, which often happens when you grab and shake a child and you end up with these, these bruises on the body. Uh, and after listening to it for about an hour, I finally raised my hand and stood up rather hesitantly and, and tried to describe the fact that my children get this type of bruise all the time because uh, they have a, a genetic disorder. And their mother, who was a teacher here at the Ross School for many years, uh, and was a very well-loved teacher, uh, and many of the people in the room here knew, knew her, she passed away about a year ago from consequences of this um, particular condition. It's called um, vascular Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, and it's a connective tissue disorder. Um, and we, she wasn't diagnosed until she was 19. My children were diagnosed when they were born. Um, their, Allison lived at, Donaldson was a classic Ross teacher. She loved everything about the school. She was, she was just a great person. And, um, and I have really, all three of my children have graduated from here and they've really benefited from having come here. Uh, and you never would have known that Allison had this condition. She just lived her life um, as she wanted to and she died the way she wanted to. Um, but one of the things that I've been interested in over the last um, 30 years or so since I knew her was the possibilities of the future to prevent these kinds of aspects happening. And I went, I was at a conference about um, 10 years ago or so and talking about genetic engineering and, and one of the things that the people brought up at that point was that when I was having this conversation was that uh, this type of funding, uh, now that the government is not in the business of funding um, biological research uh, because it's politically um, a, a topic that they don't want to uh, enter into. So a lot of that now is private funding or foundation funding, like uh, your foundation. And um, so we've actually started a fund and some of you may have actually um, uh, contributed to that and I thank you for that. Uh, and if anybody wants to do that, I I'll put up some information because we're actually starting a website um, that's gonna do so. But I'll stop now. Uh, is there any way that you could tell us in your mind what you think the future is for medical technology and how this forward thinking, this way of being creative and trying to help, because big businesses don't want to get into the business of helping people who have very rare conditions. They want to help for people who have large conditions like diabetes or cancer or things where there's going to be a lot of funding uh, there. So perhaps you could give us so, some. Sorry, so thank you for. The same, yeah, in, in, in the same sense that computers, when when I was a kid, computers were the thing I saw as changing the world. If, if I was a kid right now, um, synthetic biology and genetic engineering would be the thing that I would see as changing the world. And in fact, you know, I, I also am starting to work in that. I've, um, I'm um, way behind it in my knowledge of that. Uh, compared to my knowledge of computers, but it's, it's clear that the distinction between what we engineer and what is born is becoming, is, is, is basically dissolving. Um, more and more we're going to engineer the life on Earth, we're going to engineer ourselves. Um, you know, we are already augment ourselves in various ways of eyeglasses or hearing aids or you know, heart valves or hip replacements. And I think pretty soon we're going to start augmenting ourselves, not just with these kind of crude add-ons, but we're going to start augmenting ourselves by putting back broken genes and you know, just like we you know, can put in a transplanted organ or eventually an artificially grown organ um, we're also going to put in genes to ourselves to, to fix ourselves. I think that is absolutely inevitable. We're also going to start engineering species. And it's, it's frightening and exciting. I mean, we have, you know, we have billions more people that are going to be on the planet before population starts going down. Um, they're going to want a much um, richer diet than um, poor people have today, and that is going to put strains on the on the planet. The only way we will be able to feed people is going to be by engineering new life forms. And um, we we now have the ability to basically just decide to make species extinct. We could, for instance, 
make malaria-carrying mosquitoes extinct using a technology called gene drive right now. Um, you know, that, is that a good idea? I, I don't think actually, I, I mean, it's a pretty scary idea. On the other hand, uh, it's pretty scary the number of children that die of malaria. And, you know, I think would do better to maybe make mosquitoes that don't carry, the, don't carry malaria, and maybe that's the way that we'll do it. But as soon as these technologies come along, I guarantee you that you know, when the, the corn weevils start eating the corn crop, the corn farmers are gonna wanna get rid of the corn weevils, and you know, everybody will wanna get rid of you know, whatever thing is bothering them, the gypsy moth or the bed bug, or, you know, and, and, and sometimes it will be you know, their livelihood uh, to do that. And at the same time, we'll also have the ability to bring back extinct species. So we'll be able to bring back the woolly mammoth and the dodo bird and um, the passenger pigeon, I think, will be one of the first to come back. So the, those, these technologies, are, and we'll be able to create new species that never existed before. And, and so, yeah, this is very much happening. Um, it's going to change the world and as much as computers change the world. And that's, it's a very exciting time to be alive. Um, and um, you know, the future just keeps getting more exciting. What will that have, what kind of effect will that have on certain systems now? Yeah. When you start reintroducing or introducing something that doesn't necessarily belong. So, and, I sort of think we are, our whole relationship to the world I think is shifting as profoundly as it did um, during the Enlightenment, basically. Uh, and then there was a time, the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, there was a time when we sort of felt that humans could you know, have a certain power over the world, they could understand the rules of the world, they could organize it in a logical way, they could take advantage of it and sort of think things through and apply logic and apply reason to everything and, and figure it all out. And that, that way of thinking essentially was that you know, we could mold the world to be as, as we imagined it should be. And one of the things that's happened is that technology has become so complex and so interconnected that no longer is technology really the creation of a single person. It doesn't have the, it's not like you know, building the clock. Building the internet is not something like the clock, for instance. It's, it's built by the emergent actions of lots and lots of people, most of whom don't know each other. None of them understand exactly what it does. Although they understand many things about it, they don't understand exactly in detail how it operates. And it has, it has emergent behaviors that are surprising. And we all depend on it very much. And so our, our relationship to it is almost more like our relationship with nature. It's this complicated thing that we can kind of negotiate with and have some influence over. But ultimately, it doesn't follow our reason designed principles in every possible way. It has behaviors. And I think more and more you're going to see as we start doing this genetic engineering and we start, you know, we start changing our ecosystems, we start changing our social systems, uh, we become more connected and entangled with each other and with technology, we're going to have a kind of a different relationship to the world where it's a, the there isn't much of a distinction between what we've created and what's natural, um, either in its form or in our understanding of it, in the degree we'll, we'll partially understand it and we'll understand it in the sense of sort of a, a dynamical adaptive systems and we'll understand things about it. We'll understand things about it like we understand things about ecosystems or things about life. And so I think that we're sort of moving from the enlighten, age of enlightenment to the age of entanglement. And, and we need to bring up kids that have a different way of thinking about the world, this kind of systems way of thinking about the world. Because at times I think we, we tend to overcompensate. 
and that creates a problem. That we tend to overcompensate. Well, if, if take a species that's the habitat is starting to disappear. So we concentrate so much on that species that we kind of forget about the other species that actually benefit from what we're doing. Yep. That starts an overpopulation, and, which then starts another whole system. Yeah, and we don't naturally, the human brain, I think, doesn't think as easily about complex systems as it thinks about sort of individual objects and causes and effects and, and so simple systems. So what, what happened was, I think, during the age of reason is we sort of looked at things that were apparently incredibly complicated, like the, the sky, the planets moving along, and then we were able to model those and see them in a simple way and sort of analyze them into simpler parts and, and so on. But, but now we make progress mostly not by taking things apart and looking inside them and analyzing them, but we make most of our progress now is synthetic. We put things together, we connect things, they interact, they do things that are surprising to us. We, we build things and see what happens. And more and more when we build computers or genetically engineer things, we're constructing things that we really don't know exactly what they're going to do. Um, and that's a very, very different kind of thinking exciting, but it's also scary. Yeah. Well, and I think um, the, um, you know, we, uh, the kind of education that you need to do that, I think, is, is much more difficult. Because it used to be that you, know, you, could, you could sort of have this canon of known facts, and all you had to do was you know, equip somebody with you know, the kit of known things. But, most of the problems that our students are going to be facing are problems that we don't even understand. We don't, we're not even aware of the problems. We're not even, so, so we have to, you know, we can't, we can't pre-supply them with the knowledge that they need to solve those problems. What we have to do is give them the skills so that they'll be able to learn on the fly and improvise on the fly and create on the fly. Yeah, and, and that's a, very much more difficult thing to do, and and so uh, you know that's that's why you know I I am very interested in giving kids the the ability to, for instance, program computers, so that because those are very powerful tools, and I mean certainly you know I, I'm I'm sure that a lot of time you spend teaching kids to use computers as tools to gain knowledge and learn about the things they want and so on. But I think that also having some understanding of how they work and, and um, feeling like they don't have to just do the things that somebody you know, wrote a program for them to do, you know, that they have some, some power to get in there and, and, and do something because they're going to be solving problems that we can't even imagine. Thank you. Anybody want to discuss programming? I know. Okay, sure. So, so we've been um, talking about and hearing about a lot of the changes that uh, we anticipate but very, very uncertain about. Um, but at the same time, I think that I find myself very curious about what people like you who have put so much thought and effort into thinking about future um, what your thoughts are on what do not change about humanity, That's what does not question. change. Yeah. Are there such things? Yeah, yeah. I, I, that's, that's, that's really an excellent question because that is also partly, in thinking about the, and the clock, that's part of the question, is if in 10,000 years, what really do I have in common with that person 10,000 years? So one of the things, for instance, in how you measure time. Every culture measures days and months and years. And I, you know, I suspect as long as we live on this planet, you know, that will be a part of it. Those are part of the rhythms. Of, it was part of the rhythms of people 10,000 years ago. And I suspect it will be part of the rhythms of people 10,000 years from now, at least the ones living on this planet. 
there may be <laughs> other planets and other days and months and, and but so I think that's a, a very fundamental thing about humans that stay the same. But in, in many ways, one of the things that's amazed me is looking back, because I, I did go back and kind of look, and 10,000 years ago was picked because you could kind of go back 10,000 years, and we know things about people that lived 10,000 years ago, and certainly people that lived 5,000 years ago, but we have stories. And you know, it's amazing, for instance, our, you know, um, you know we've, the way that people loved their children, you know, the way that people um, you know, tried to understand you know, how they were part of a bigger pattern. You know, all of that really is something that we have in common with them. And so more and more I see that, that a kind of continuity, that we're part of a, we're part of a story. We're still kind of asking many of the same questions that people were asking. 10,000 years ago. We have, you know, we have more tools, we have more toys, um, but I think that um, the, you know, we still understand the stories that were told then. They still make sense to us in terms of the human, the human motivations and, and so on. So there are, there are repeating themes um, of continuity that I think come from our physical environment and um, come from the way that we're wired to think. So we do think in terms of causes and effects. And I'm not sure that's anything, I don't think the universe really has causes and effects. I think that's a part of the, that's our storytelling. So we're storytellers. And that's our basic way of understanding the world is as storytellers, and I suspect we're going to continue to be that even, even 10,000 years from now. So one of the things th throughout history that's driven uh, humans uh, is the issue of dying. So what's your view about what's coming in the future in terms of uh, possibly being able to extend life indefinitely? So, I think there's two senses of extending it indefinitely. One is our bodies, keeping our bodies going, and the other is keeping our continuity of thoughts going. And there's sort of two different paths where that might happen. So, it is possible that, you know, we're among the last generation that has to die. Certainly, we could imagine the technologies for regenerating our bodies, continuing to regenerate our bodies, including our, our neurons. Um, but I think that probably the other thing that's going to happen, though, is it's not clear to me that we're, I mean, that what makes us human, let's say the storytelling ability or whatever, necessarily has to be tied to our body. So I mm -hmm. think more and more we're going to start projecting that into our machines. And, and, and so I think our, more and more our machines will become extensions of us. And so you know, right now, kids no longer need to know things in the way that I had to know things because they have the ability to find things out so easily. Um, you know, they can just search and machine. Well, I can imagine that pretty soon I'm going to have a, something in my brain or connected to my brain so that I can just think and do the equivalent of you know, searching the internet and I will know the answer. But then once I've done that, it's as if you know, that's become part of my mind. Right now, it's, you know, it's separated by the crudeness of having to type something into a keyboard and read it off. So I think one of the things that may happen is that, that we actually become much bigger than our individual bodies. And, and so the who the we is that survives may be something much more interesting than just you know, the sort of physical longevity of the body. Um, but we may fundamentally transform into something bigger that transcends the body. Um, and you know, it's kind of hard to imagine, um, but I, 
I suspect that's, that's in our future. So the children that our teachers are teaching right now might be in that generation, right? I think they will, I, I, I think it's possible. And I, I think it's much more likely that they'll have very, very long lives compared to ours. Um, I think one of the things that also is gonna change is, I, I think we forget what an unusual moment we're alive at, that during my lifetime, the population of, of the Earth has more than doubled. That's never happened for anybody that was born before me. It never happened during their lifetime. Uh, it's probably never gonna happen um, during future lifetimes. I mean, it's really, it's a kind of a one-time event that there was this explosion that was basically caused by science and enlightenment and the power that, you know, that gave us over the world. Um, but there's every reason, every projection I've seen suggests that, you know, by um, 2075, well, the population of the Earth won't be growing anymore. In fact, it will probably be shrinking. But what happens so if people don't die? Kind of, well, so uh, one of the interesting things is, this, is that, is that um, when people don't, oh, I mean, um, when people don't die, they actually seem to have fewer children too, and they have children at a much lower rate, and so. Um, it doesn't seem to, that extending lifespan seems to cause population to go up. Um, now maybe, you know, maybe that's just anomalous, but it, it, it hasn't been true in the past. So, and the other, so, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to imagine because it's so different. Um, I think that maybe one thing that you know, as we become more connected to sort of the this is a really hard concept to express, but more and more, I guess when when my friend um, Richard Feynman mm -hmm. was about to die, he had cancer and it had come back and forth a few times, and I was, I was walking with him. I didn't realize how far it had gone along. He was telling me some funny story about his interaction with his doctors, and, but I realized it was kind of also a way of him telling me, he was giving me new information that he was about to die. And I, uh, I got very sad, and he's like, what's the matter? And you know, with anybody else, I probably wouldn't have said what was the matter, but he was, so, he was somebody who so loved the truth that I said, I'm, I'm sad because I'm realizing you're about to die. And he said, yeah, that bugs me sometimes too. <laughs> In fact, he said, uh, but I have to say that you know, I've gotten, I see people using my work all over. I told so many stories. I hear the stories repeated. I, see the techniques I've developed being used by so many people. And, you know, in a way, I'm here more than I ever was. And, you know, that, that makes me feel okay about it. And, and I think as, as we get more connected with each other and more ability to kind of spread out and impact each other, I, you know, I think the sense in which we die may, may be less that you know, our ideas will live on, our actions will live on, our, and, and I think that as more, more of our mind becomes out there in this sort of shared mind of connected, uh, shared mind, it's, you know, our, our bodies may come and go, but that continuity of experience in some sense may become the thing that, that lives. I know that's for, that's very abstract, but can I ask the faculty um, how would you discuss this with your students? I mean, this week has been about this is their life. Um, you're preparing them for a future that you've heard directions that 
seemingly are going to uh, manifest uh, these possibilities. But how, how would you, and at what age? I would start with storytelling because there's a thread across the last couple of weeks is hearing people from different disciplines telling their story and you starting with that book is, is a great example. Um, and so, you know, in a literature classroom or in some kind of writing exercise, you can do something as simple as, you know, writing about comparing, contrasting a year from now to now, five years to now, and you go back, but then reverse it, and you can start projecting out and give even young students a very um, good exercise in, in imagining the past and, and then projecting and imagining the future. What's also important, and I just want to say this, um, the only book my students ever connected to in community colleges across New England was The Clock of the Long Now. Okay. And I just need to thank you for that. Wow. Um, it was in an ethics class. We used it in foundations classes. And no matter what the background, no matter, I mean, we're talking phlebotomist to future scholar at Brown to criminal <laughs> in some cases, <laughs> um, really found this very compelling because I think they think about this a lot. There's a story in today's New York Times about millennials uh, really rejecting credit based on their experience of watching their parents and watching this generation go through such crises between 2008, the second crash that kind of happened quietly at 11 and 12, and the possible third one that's, that's coming. And t empowering people by way of story unifies the entire curriculum. And I think it builds empathy. And I want to do one final little scholarly thing. Yesterday during Dr. Rifkin's talk, I was reminded that at both the Wharton School and at the Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth, there are current scholars, very well-renowned scholars, who are redefining leadership in a way that fits this curriculum because every one of the characteristics we've seen on the projected are now being studied and are offering more quantitative data-driven studies that reinforce what we're doing. So I think telling the story, having our students learn how to tell their stories, and then connecting them in ways that are, quite frankly, surprising and, and short-circuiting. I did not expect you to have loved Eleanor Cameron's The Wonderful Flight to the Mushroom <laughs> Planet, the way a scary librarian when I was seven years old and cowering in a corner. I hated the library, honestly. I, this woman was terrifying, comes to me you know, crooked, and I come to find out she's dealing with pain. She gives me J James and the Giant Peach in the library in Islip. And here I am, 45 years later, I'm remembering her, and I want to tell her story, and I won't, but I want to tell her story because I became a scholar. I hated the library, and she was also scary. Uh, but but this, <laughs> this, this interesting creature, this interesting let's say helper in that journey, hands me James and Giant Peach, which becomes the most important book of my life at that time. And if we know, you know, it, I won't go into details, but it's just so, Im imagine the moments we've had where just handing a book or empathetically saying to somebody, how are you? Or, or hey, you know what's really a great movie? I, um, we were just talking about Ex Machina over, over um, lunch today. So, that came from students and exchange between students and teachers, and it, I think it just empowers everybody to better tell their story. And the last note is, because we need each other. And I think that is crystal clear. Even though there are politics, there is always going to be faculty questions, and there's always going to be you know, tensions between different ways of doing this. But one thing that's crystal clear is, through storytelling and through at least having the time to gather we, we can see a connection that I, I never saw in your work, which I've been reading for 12 years, you know, because you came up here and told a story, and that, I think, empowers students. There's a lot in there, but thank, thank that's you. me. Get used to it. <laughs> so does anybody else have an idea about how they... Mark? Huh? All right. Um, I was thinking, too, that, that through story as well, um, uh, well, just step back for a second. I think one of the things, too, I think is when you are spending time in the classroom, and uh, not to be morbid about it, but I press upon my students that there's a fin finite amount of time 
that we are going to spend together in this class. And um, I mess around more than most humans, I think. But, uh, but when we're here, we're here and it's business and we're, we're, we're caring about things and so on. But one of the interesting things that was brought up, um, I was reading the Iliad, and right before a major battle in the Iliad, throughout the, the, the humans are, are, the mortals are having conversations with the immortals and the mortals are you know, trying to figure out how, how to deal with things. But there's this big battle at the end um, and right before all that, the immortals go and they have this mock cheesy battle um, you know, where they're fighting each other and there's this, this chapter about them fighting each other and it just gets goofy. And you're kind of like, why is that even in there? But when you really start to think about it, you start to suggest that they have nothing to, they, they can't fight. They have nothing to fight for. They have nothing because they're not going to die. And so this is their play battle for the real thing that mortals have to go through. And it's been a really interesting thing where we talk about mortality and the, and the value of mortality. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and this was brought up again, I guess, in the teaching of the epics of uh, Paradise Lost. And, and that the one thing that God can't do in Paradise Lost is he... He's got to be God. So, like, uh, you know, he, God is good. Maybe you should write a song. Um, but, uh, but, but the deal is, is this, is that he can't be other than good. So humans are interesting because they could be many things. And the idea of possibility and the idea of choices that actually comes out of that. And that you may not make the right choices, but you have a chance to make the choices. And um, so mortality gives us that shot clock on life that makes it more interesting. Um, and uh, as a result, I think it's kind of this sort of way of dealing with if we're going to be here. And I'm always, I'm always curious if Vikings are interesting because they know they're going to die, or at least their belief in the mythology. They know, and they know that, you know, so how do you live when you know that? And, uh, and I think that's intriguing, and I, and I think it's intriguing for kids n to deal with the reality of it, but also understand the power of that. And... And at least in my teaching, that's what I try to implement is, is that, and emphasize that we aren't gonna be here forever. Um, and we're gonna rub off on each other and I'm gonna carry you with me and you're gonna carry me with you and for better or for worse, but, um, but hopefully for better so we use our time here wisely and, um, and you know, in an intimate way, I think, um, so. But, but what about writing, I mean, what about talking to kids about writing the myth of the future? myths of the future. So in other words, if you were to take them on an, on an, an exercise, because we want to have you have some time during the year that focuses on the future, and be implementing um, some of the uh, things that you've learned from here in your classroom in terms of whether you think of it as science fiction or you, however, however you choose to present it to the kids and let them with their own imaginations, uh, because that, that would really give you a platform if they were storytelling about what is projecting onto the future. But they have to have some uh, um, um, anchors in terms of real work and research that's being done now that they can extend. So that that way we have a sense of uh, knowing you know, they'll reflect if they have fears. They'll reflect if they ha some of them could be very exciting to kids. Um, can you imagine the ramifications for religion if you don't die? That's huge. Because um, to some religions, not all religions. So I, I think it's a really fertile area. And if, it, if our job is to um, really prepare kids to educate them about the past, you know, so they have perspective, um, but also, and, and that they have their value systems. But then we got to take them out there into really what, you know, before it was science fiction. So, and now it's not, and it won't be in their lifetime. And then we've got the environment, you know, where we're up against uh, the environmental issues. So the, the, psychologically they're gonna, and emotionally, they're going to have a lot to cope with. So I think the more we can create opportunities for them to, to wander in a, in a different landscape, and even if they're doing in terms of mythology and, and fiction, that it, it, it opens the door 
to um, thinking about it, and, and then thinking about what skill sets are they going to need to navigate uh, this landscape? Because this has never happened before that so, we know of. Yeah. So one thing that I didn't think of doing, but multiple kids have sent me stories that they've written where they've heard about the clock and they've imagined themselves Being the as visitor. adults visiting it. Mm -hmm. But to do that, they also have to sort of imagine what the world is like when they're going to be visiting it. So it's always kind of, a, it's, it's sort of science fiction, but in, you know, for them, they don't really make a distinction between 10,000 years from now and when they're grown up. It's, <laughs> it's, you know, it's just in that unthinkable future that, there's, that they're starting to think about. And, and it, it amazes me um, you know, that you know, the things that they think about and the things that they imagine changing and the things they imagine don't changing that are very different than, than what I did. But I think that exercise of somehow putting yourself into the future is, is I think it's very hard if it used to be that you know kids could you know look at their parents and say I'm going to do what they did, but kids can't do that anymore. Very very rarely. But can you they... imagine being on this cusp where you know our generation probably won't make it, but their generation could make it into this extreme longevity? I mean that that's really. Um, profound in terms of, you know, how, because they will experience the loss of death of their parents and their grandparents and uh, others, but they might not experience death of their peers or, the, yeah, or their son, themselves. So, so, but they may not be as scared about it as we are. And that's what I think is interesting, is to have them imagine. And writing, drawing, painting um, would be, we need to be doing that in the school, because it gives a platform for expression and kind of dancing with the ideas. At the same time, they're learning about uh, scientific breakthroughs, um, technological breakthroughs. Um, they would, of course, they need to learn about genetics. So, so in other words, underneath it, we're giving them a scientific foundation or a technological foundation because we want to be their kids computing across the, the school, programming, um, building robots. So, so we, we want to get them to, and I, I think that's what you were saying. In other words, if they're making things, if they know how to program, if they're making things, then there's a certain different feeling that you're a little bit in charge and helping to create the future. And I think that's really important, is that you have some kind of security, to, to, that you have some kind of sense that you can help uh, the future. It's not just going to happen to you. And there, you know, because I think we probably have more anxiety than they do, um, and, and I don't know this. You may discover that they have just as much. But um, I know that they're empathic. Most of the kids here, I can feel it. You see it in their work, especially empathic about uh, any the un environmental challenges, and empathic to to many different species. I mean, they just get really um, very emotional and deeply moved by that. So, giving them uh, possibilities for participate, even if it's just on the local level, is really important. But but I think this is what our job is and especially our job in August, which is to really to um, be exposed to, uh, uh, and when you think of the last few years, we did, uh, I don't know, how long ago was it, we had Ralph do a systems theory? Four? Four years? Four years in August. Then we, that was the preparation for sustainability because you really can't really understand sustainability if you don't understand system theory. And those of you who are new to Ross, we will work to, to catch you up to that, and, and your, your peers will also help share um, with that. And by the way, the kids may teach you too. <laughs> so, uh, so, so there was system theory, sustainability, 
and now we're moving into the future because the future is, is literally tomorrow. Um, in terms of some of the things that when I would go, when Danny was speaking at TED conference, you know, these, these things were on the drawing board 20 years ago, you know, that were being presented as, you know, because you, you wanted them to, some of them you wanted to be here tomorrow, but as a matter of fact, when you go, when you go to Danny's uh, um, playhouse, I call it, it's a playhouse for genius, geniuses that, that tinker, and um, you see all these different things being created. And, and of course, I'm always thinking, that would be great at the school, you know, because these are all prototypes. And um, so, so for that technology, you know, even when you had that flat um, mapping mm -hmm. system, which is now on this, right? Can you, can you share? Because I was so excited because I thought, God, we could have this at Ross. All the kids would be playing. Yeah, that was a, I, I think that's my, uh, my best invention ever. It was, was great. It was, um, well, it was a, a map. I always wanted, as a kid, I wanted, I loved maps. And I always wanted a map that I could just zoom into more and more. And, and so when computers finally got along, I built this map that you could zoom into and you could the pinch to zoom thing. And then um, I actually showed it to Steve Jobs, tried to get him to put it on their computers, and they weren't ready for it yet. But when, when iPhones came out, um, they had it on it, and then you know, finally the technology got there. And now I see little kids um, that do this with like magazines. Right. And they do it on books too. They do it, yeah, they expect everything to, <laughs> to do that. Is that right? And yeah. They'll open up a little picture book and they'll start going like uh -huh. make it bigger. <laughs> and, and, there um, you go. <laughs> and so that was, and, and, and actually the, it was a, a, a nice thing happened recently which was that Apple tried to sue, sue all the other cell phone manufacturers for, because they also tried to patent it, but the patent office ruled that their patent was invalid because I had invented it before, so really? that was it. <laughs> <laughs> but there's so many of these applications but, that are pertinent to education. But, that's, but, but you know, that's, that's a way where, you know, to me it's, it's so great because now that's part of you know, human expectation of the world. And in some sense, you can't even imagine inventing that now. It's just, it's, it's, I, I suspect future people will just think kids are born with that expectation. Uh, Did they but, come out like this? <laughs> it's a part of you that you'll need to like Yeah, and, yeah, that, that was the, so that's the sense of which, you know, it's, a, it's a, a, a continuity. But I do think that this notion that being able to build things and being able to create things is, it's a way of dealing with the world which is unpredictable. I mean, we can't, we really can't plan for the future. We can't, in the sense that I think it would be very difficult for a student today to say, I'm gonna do this job and study for that job and expect that job to still be there and the same by the time they got to it. But I if you have the ability to build, right. that gives you a completely different relationship to it because you don't have to predict the future. You can, you can create it, and you can, you have a tool for creating things in it, and, and so on. So, I, think I, I also, th so, I'm sorry, Danny. I, I also think that the senior projects, what we learned from those senior projects, because it's kind of the flowering and the culmination at the same time. So, uh, we may want to look at uh, unpacking the senior project and taking it down. Uh, and across the grades in a way that um, is, a mod is modified but involves some of the same dynamics as the senior project because the kids are so challenged. And, and what I think, and, and um, alumni have said this too, is that the, the, they are, first of all, they pick something themselves that they're passionate about. And there's rigor. Um, and sometimes they take on things that they have absolutely no idea how to produce, matter of fact, most of the time. And, they're so, and they struggle because they've got all the other stuff, college placement and 
testing and all this other stuff senior year, which happens in this building. So the, so the uh, uh, vibrations in this building are pretty intense, uh, especially in the fall. So, uh, and then you can sort of feel things when you know, they finish their senior project. And, and also they're so proud of themselves and, and because their, whatever their outcome is, is something that they were passionate about, that they exhibit, that um, there's a demonstration of their, of their work. And I think, so if we unpack this, we could start this at earlier grades, um, just modules. And uh, I think one of the things that I'm really proud of, of what's done at the school is, is that these faculty really engages with the student in terms of being sensitive to their passions. And I, I think that these wonderful librarians that uh, you've talked about, you know, clearly, intuitively, somehow, they were observing you. And, um, and that's giving love, you know, if you observe somebody and you care about them. And then, and, and by the way, probably you two guys were, you know, um, <laughs> probably a little bit of a loss because there may be people that didn't understand uh, you and what your interests were. So something about these librarians, Dale. <laughs> Don't forget to take your kids to the library. Um, but anyway, I want to thank Danny for coming um, so much back to Ross, and I hope he'll come again. And um, we uh, are very grateful to have had you here. Well, thank you all very much. I've met enough Ross students now at this point that I really do think that uh, the future is going to be in good hands. So thank you. Thank you.